didn't intend to scare you with today's scripture. But uh, this is one of the most negative scriptures, I think, in the, in the Gospels. Jesus, he confronts the, the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees represent our old religious concepts, stuff we heard as kids, the stuff that we heard in Sunday school and then kind of, well, maybe got a twisted idea of what it was all about or the superstitions that we heard from a variety of people about life and about, about religion. They're very literal. Take things absolutely literal. And he gives them what for in this particular section. Uh, and I mean, he, he, he gives it to them. He really lets them have it. So I'm going to let you watch him let them have it. Now understand, there's a great depth of symbolism here. I, I'm going to suggest that you've just seen another miracle. What's the miracle? As soon as he started lambasting them, they didn't run off. That they stayed until he was done. That he got their attention. At this time, the the temple was was pretty corrupt. Um, the elders at, in the temple lived off the poor people, and the the people were desperately hoping that someone would lead them out of what, what at, at the time was misery. They they wanted a Messiah. They wanted someone to to lead them out of this this. Uh, rigid, legalistic kind of thinking. You've heard of black and white thinking? Well, that sounds like the Pharisees. You heard of, of rigid thinking, rigid belief systems? That's the Pharisees. Now, we have them. They're inside us. Do you ever think you have to do something just right? Say a, an affirmation, the right affirmation, and find the right words in order for it to work? Or to, to pray to God in a certain way or in a certain position or it won't work? There's a reason Charles Fillmore did a Sunday lesson here and then it became part of a book, one of his, the... Uh, uh, a chapter called uh, Reform Your God Thought where he said you don't have to go to God and state. What does it mean to go to God and state? Get down on your knees and be humble and speak to God like God is so much greater than you are. He said you can ask God for anything because people were afraid to talk to God or pray to God about certain things. <clears throat> he, he came up against these kinds of attitudes in people that came from <clears throat> old-time religion, old-time teaching, old-time superstition. And <clears throat> I'm sure that there's some level of it in each one of us. I've, well, when I used to teach... <sighs> Those CEP classes, you know, I would hear students ask each other if they had a good affirmation for such and such. Like, like you had to find the right affirmation. <coughs> you do, but it has to be right for you. It has to have meaning to you. You can't get a book of affirmations and just start using every one. Oh, thank you. You need to, uh, to use words that that are meaningful to you because what needs to be changed? God? No, 
You, us, we need, we need to change our thoughts, our beliefs, our attitudes. So, Pharisees, Charles Fillmore said, and he said this in the, in the uh, Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, if you look up Pharisees, he said there's more today than in Jesus' time. Yeah, there are all kinds of people who have been taught all kinds of rigid belief systems and rigid ways of approaching God or thinking about God. The, uh, the word Pharisee, the name Pharisee, comes uh, from the Hebrew, it's a Greek word, and it means separatists, literalists. And it sounds perfectly good to me because what does it do? It actually, that kind of thinking that comes out of the intellect, it separates you from God, separates you from your source. Because if you think about God in certain of these legalistic, rigid ways and that, that, that God's so distant, so, so much greater, you have, can have no connection with, with God, then it separates you from the source of your good. And at the end, when he's crying over Jerusalem, that's crying over all of us. Us who are part of this spiritual community that we're we're missing the mark in this I'm going to do the scripture and, and let's do a real quick fly through because there's so much in this that's just fascinating and said Jesus to the crowd and to the disciples the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses seat Moses seat it was a seat in the temple that was dedicated to Moses, it's where the reader of the scripture of the, of the Torah would sit until the time for the reading. It's where pronouncements were made. It represents a seat of authority. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in a seat of authority, the same authority as Moses. When we have those deep set legalistic beliefs about God, that God is separate, that we can't approach God, that God has to be approached in certain formal ways. They come with a, with a great deal of, of authority, a lot of power. And they, they do just what the name Pharisees mean. They separate us from our source. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. In other words, they're about show. They, uh, continue Chris. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. Heavy burdens. In Judaism, 613 things good things you need to do every day. 613, if you will, rules that you have to abide by. I don't know that I can remember 613. Oh, yesterday, you wouldn't believe it, I got up to 612. And the last one I got wrong. I have to try again today, maybe I'll do better. You're familiar with, with people who have taught you that there's all these rules that God has, right? All these things you have to do to get God to love you. Do you have to do anything to get God to love you? No, God is love. That's its nature. You are a creation of itself. It already does love you, meaning it's already one with you. You're not united in that bond of lover forever. They do all their deeds to be seen by men. In the, the Sermon on the Mount about practicing your piety before men. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Remember I talked about 
the boxes with the, the Shema and other, other scripture. That one went on the, on the forehead and one went on the, the left arm, the same level as the heart. The fringes, four corners of the outer robe. And also on the prayer shawls, on the four corners of the prayer shawls. Make them nice and long so everybody can see. I guess it means we're more spiritual. It's outer form, all about the outer form. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue. It reminds me of Charles Fillmore when this was World Headquarters, Unity Inn next door, he'd go over to lunch. Oh, Mr. Fillmore, come on, come to the head of the line. No, I'm, he'd get in line right at the end. He didn't run up to the front. There's stories about him when he'd get his, his pay from the pay person. I guess in those days they probably did it in cash. And he would count some out and give it back. That's a different attitude than taking the best seat and the, the best place in the synagogue. And salutations in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. When I was in school at Unity, first year, Gary Jones, in one of our probably first week of classes, he gave us an assignment. And that assignment was to go to our bathroom mirrors and write on it with something, with a marker, the reverend and then put your name. because we need to get used to hearing that. And at first, it's difficult because what is it that a lot of us feel? I am not worthy. That's a big load, that's a big weight. And yet, people in the world want to refer to us in some, some capacity. So we need to get used to hearing it. There's times where it's necessary. You go into a, a, an intensive care unit, and uh, well, one night leaving the theater in the park, playing a show, one of the horn players in theater of the park had been taken to hospital in Sh Shawnee Mission Hospital, uh, having having a heart attack. And it was about midnight when the show was over and we got out of the park and I stopped at the hospital. And all I had to say was, I identify myself as Reverend Nettler, I'm a friend of so-and-so. And I was taken upstairs right to his bed. And he said, how'd you get in here? <laughs> because sometimes it's necessary, but it's off awfully if, if you're, unless you have a huge ego, it's a hard thing to hear. I don't, certainly don't use it a lot out in public. <laughs> so many times I say to people, just call me Greg, please, just call me Greg. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. And you are all brethren. Who's the one teacher? Christ. And Jesus said, you know, that's, send you a, a teacher, the Holy Spirit. It's God's very own spirit. But we all have that inner teacher, the Christ in us. And that makes us all brothers because we have a relative in common with everyone. So whose head's higher? Nobody's head is higher. No one. We come from the same source. We have all the same potentials. We're all loved and worthy in God's sight. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Shema Yisrael. Hear. The Lord your God is one. Same father of everyone. 
Jesus could tell us, my father and your father, one source. Neither be called masters, for you have one master. Oh, you may be, you may be uh, under the sway of the master we call ego, but that's not a true master. That God's spirit within you is the master that you should follow. Be open, receptive, and responsive to it. Remember its presence. Christ in you. That's why it's not only your hope, but assurance of glory. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Yes. To serve one another. That's what we're here for. It's amazing the people who have served me in some capacity. Sometimes just a, a chance encounter and they say something. They do something. He who is greatest among you, eh. whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. <coughs> whoever exalts himself, what, what's exalting himself? That's a pretty big ego, isn't it? And that's the human perception. It's a human consciousness. And that's not who and what we truly are. But woe to you. Well, that's a nice word. Anybody said woe to you in your lifetime? Hmm. Well, <laughs> sounds like something out of Macbeth. Um, he says it to the Pharisees seven times. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of heaven against men. How? <coughs> Rigid, legalistic ideas about God and your relationship to God that keep us separated from God. False concepts of God. This is an error belief about the source, about God the Father, about the Creator. You neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in because you block us. This error belief about God, about ourselves. Next one. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you traverse sea and land to make a single proselyte convert, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. You go, Jesus. Why do you think of that? Yeah, and what does that mean? You bind him with all, you, these error beliefs bind us with all these limitations and false ideas about God and about ourselves, and then we don't make the connection. We don't touch that source. We don't feel worthy. We don't know how. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. What's the gold worth? What is it, about $1,000 an ounce today? What a... What does human consciousness look at? The material thing. Not what makes the gold holy or precious, but seeing the material thing instead of the source of the good. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold of the temple that has made the gold sacred. Keep going. And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. What's more important, the gift or that which makes it sacred or holy? Looking at the matter, the material, and not the source of it. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift, the altar, that makes the gift sacred? Next 
So he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. Who dwells in it. Symbolically, it was God's house, right? So you swear by the temple, you're swearing by your creator. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Go to the source. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill, and he pronounced it coming, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Do the outer things that people can see. But justice, mercy, faith, those are internal qualities, are they not? Nobody can see those except the results of them as it works through you. So they're concerned. And a lot of these, this legalistic thinking, this black and white thinking is about stuff out here and looking good and behaving like you're a spiritual being instead of being that spiritual being. <coughs> these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You bind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. When's the last time you swallowed a camel? Well, gnats, they're almost invisible sometimes, but they sure are irritating, aren't they? And persistent. Looking at the little piece that they lay hold of and, and, and seems to, to demand your attention rather than what's really important. And yet at the same time, if we fall for it, for all this stuff, for this legalistic thinking, for this error belief about God and our relationship to God, aren't we swallowing the camel? Believe me, if I'm gonna swallow a camel, I want plenty of water to wash it down. Uh, we take in a lot of stuff and accept a lot of things about ourselves, about God, about our relationship to each other and the world, it's not, that are not true. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they're full of extortion and rapacity. Look good. Look good. We could all come to church all dressed up and act and behave like we're just so spiritual and then go home and abuse the kids or scream and and at the dog and maybe beat the dog and curse at people in traffic oh you don't ever do that do you cancel cancel <laughs> You blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and of the plate, that the outside also may be clean. You, we work to clean our consciousness. It's not about how you look, it's about how you think. Not about your appearance in the world or among your friends, but how you live in the world, what you present to the world as the real and true spiritual essence that you are. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful. I was expecting initially that that could have said whitewashed outhouses. They can look pretty wonderful, can't they? But within, they're full of dead man's bones. And... Those are the things of the past. Things that are no longer part of life, that are long gone, and yet we hold on to those. Old ideas, old attitudes, old concepts, old beliefs. And at some level we might even know they don't work, but we hold on to them. So you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monument of the righteous. Live in the past. Worship the things of the past. And don't see the here and now. Jesus said, now is the appointed time. A lot of times we keep ourselves in these tombs of yesterday, the past. I don't care what you did when you were six years old and you got scolded for. You're not that person. You made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. Total difference. If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Yeah, thus you witness against yourselves, that your sons of those who murdered the prophets, who killed, who stopped the truth. If, you're, if, if you have these error concepts, any of these seven, uh, you're blocking the truth and the reality from yourself and from your life. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. Fill it up with the truth. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? And what is hell? Useless, unnecessary suffering. Because we don't know the truth. We don't un understand reality. We're looking at appearances and we're all caught up in out here and the things of the world. Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify. That means the inspiration, the guidance is yours and it comes to you and it comes to you in a variety of ways whether it's through somebody else's mouth or writing or inner inspiration. But what does it mean to kill them? To crucify them? To negate it. To think about it and say, well that'll never work. Well that's silly. Yeah. When you start to teach prosperity and you talk about giving and tithing, well, I want more. I don't want to give away what I got. <laughs> okay. But maybe you need to open your mind. And some you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. And upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of innocent Abel. Abel, remember Abel? First martyr. Cain. Okay. Yeah, first martyr in, in the Old Testament. And the last martyr. Zechariah in the Old Testament. First and last martyrs in, in, in the scripture. Continue sanctuary and the altar thank you very much truly i say to you all this will come upon this generation what is in consciousness is what comes comes true comes to you ex, you experience in your time here so this, this passage of scripture, a lot of people might pass over and they, well, that's, that's about then. And the, no, it's about us. And it's about right here and right now. It's been included because it is important. And what a powerful teaching Jesus has done in this powerful lesson. And it shows you the compassion of God, the love of God, who desires each one of us to grow and unfold to that highest potential. As Jesus was crying over everyone who was held back by any of this stuff. Those who didn't have life enough, health enough, substance enough, 
joy or peace enough. 